<laughs> so anyway, um, the, an overview of what CNC is. So uh, CNC is basically cutting uh, soft materials and certain hard materials with digital controls. It stands for computer numerical control, which is an evolution of NC or numerical control, which is it in and of itself an evolution of the machine tool sort of world that was created around standard machine shop tools like mills and lathes. Uh, so it's all basically derivative of those machines like the bridge pour and the lathes we have downstairs. Um, they can cut a wide variety of materials. Um, even more exotic ones than what we're talking about here, but uh, generally um, anything in the wood shop, they can do plastics and woods. Um, certain soft materials, depending on how hard it is, may also be able to be handled by that. Since it is, in the case of the wood shop, a CNC router, it really can cut anything that is suitable for cutting on your standard uh, table router or hand router. So anything suitable for that will also be able to be handled by the Shapoko or the Gerber. For metal, there's the small Tormach machine in the metal shop. It is much more precise, but also much more powerful and also is uh, requires a little bit more setup for making sure you can machine properly. So with computer numerical control, there's so many different ways that it can be laid out. There's many types of machines from very, very professional ones like that sleek looking one you can see on the middle left to much more basic streamlined ones, like the one just above that. It's a, that's like a type of um, like suspension CNC, or I've heard some people call it like spider CNCs, where it's literally like what you're seeing at the top there, it's a board just standing up and it has a router that has two pulleys that allows it to go to any X and Y coordinate to cut out something. Very, very popular a few years ago with the hobbyist community before more sophisticated CNCs got onto the market. But what you have to realize is that what it's doing is it is taking a high power, high torque motor, spinning up a tool bit, like you can see there, the end mills, which we're going to talk about in a second. And those mills are then moved around by a robotic system in XY coordinates to cut out different tool paths. So again, like I was saying, we've actually covered CNC like tools before, the laser cutter, 3D printers, the water jet, all derivative of the same technologies that allow CNC to exist. In fact, those are the children of these CNC machines. So end mills are not drill bits. This is really important, especially because um, you want to make sure you're using the right tool for the job. So end mills, uh, oftentimes just called colloquially tools. Um, typically in these softwares, it just refers to any and um, any end bit attached into something, you refer to it as a tool. Tool can take many forms, but generally an end mill is considered one of the most standard tools. It has spiral grooves that like the drill bit will pull waste out of the uh, hole that's being cut. Uh, they are usually much thicker and much harder than your average drill bit and have much more complicated machining on them. There are some crazy end mills out there that do a ton of things much more sophisticated than drill bits. Um, they are also, because they are designed to handle more torque, they're always held in a collet. We're gonna get into a little bit more detail of what a collet is later. But it's essentially the part of the motor that's going to hold the end mill. That collet will be specifically engineered to hold a very specific shank size on the end mill. A drill bit, like you can see visually, are very different, they take up their own forms. The big difference is, you'll notice on an end mill, they're usually flat on the end, or there are some specialized ones that are round. But drill bits will almost always have either a point, a very sharp point, or a very shallow point to help them center as they drill. And also, you'll notice they have fewer and shallower flutes. Again, those helical patterns that pull material out of the hole. Um, and they also can be held in chucks, although they can also be held in collets as well. Uh, but a chuck, if you ever see the drill press, it's that thing that's going to hold the bit. Um, technically, and this is like kind of a no-no, you can put an end mill in a drill press in a pinch. It is not recommended, however, 
because the RPMs required and the torque required to run an end mill safely, safely cannot be achieved by a drill press. So this is just my comment right now for the drill press downstairs. Do not, in big capital bold letters, put end mills into the drill press. It's not designed for that. Yes. So um, when you say the RPMs don't align, is it that it requires fewer RPMs or more RPMs than a drill press? Uh, it'll depend on the material. Typically for harder materials, like what an end mill can handle, you'll actually be running at a lower RPM, but at a much higher torque. A drill press just can't achieve the torque that an end mill really needs to bite into something. You might see stuff online that says a little bit different and you know, to an extent they are correct, but again, it is not recommended to do. In a CNC, however, an end mill can perform plunging or drilling operations, but that is under the control of a machine properly tuned to handle those materials. So just, just as a safety note and safety and health of the tool note. Okay. End mills don't love plunging. Is yes. Generally the rule of thumb. If you're doing a lot of plunging, you need to drill a lot of holes. The drill bit is going to be the tool for the job. So the end mill basically just stays on the surface and cuts so, sort of laterally. Yeah, so cutting you can kind of see here. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah. the, the big thing about a end mill that's different from a drill bit is that it's engineered like Adam was saying, not to cut in a plunge direction, but to actually cut side to side. Um, most engineered um, end mills do have the ability to plunge and will be designed to plunge. Um, however, yes, it, that puts a lot of stress on the end mill. But you can see here, this is just an illustration of the types of flute patterns that can be had. There are straight flutes, which you see on a lot of table router bits. You, if you've had exposure to them in the wood shop, that should look pretty familiar to you. There are flutes with an up cut and flutes with a down cut. So oh, the reason why you'd have an up cut is especially in materials. Oh, yes. Are you sharing your screen? Oh, have I not been sharing my screen this whole time? I uh, bet you I haven't. Suggests sharing it. Yep, I bet you I forgot. All right, cool. Thank you, Hobby. So back to what we were saying. So when looking at different types of flutes, there is the up cut and the down cut. Those are the general flute directions. The direction of the flute is essentially how it's going to move chips in or out of the hole. Generally, an up cut is good for materials that generate a lot of chips and might be prone to catching fire. So for instance, it's great on wood because it's going to clear the chips out of the hole and allow them to carry away heat and prevent any kind of uh, flame from happening from over milling or if there's, you know, God forbid, any rubbing in the part. Um, and also it can be, it can reduce chatter and they tend to be a little sharper. Uh, with down cut bits, down cut bits are actually really good for plastic materials uh, because plastic is a little gummier than wood and tends to want to be pulled up by the router. So when you have a down cut bit where the flutes actually push down as they cut, it'll actually force your material down onto the work bed and actually make it so that your uh, material will be kept more stable. It's just that there's less room for the chips to be pushed out. They will be pushed behind the end mill and without proper dust collection, there could be a buildup of chips. But it's really just talking about the behavior of the chips as they move through the material. Also with types of end mills. So you can see from this screenshot of McMaster car, if you can think of a shape, there's an end mill at heart. There's specialty contour end mills, all different kinds of end mills, particular purposes for cutting keyways, for engraving, for doing undercuts. You know, I, I in one of my previous lives, I used a T-slot -slot cutter bit almost all the time. And uh, they can be a little tricky, but fun. Um, and uh, a lot of, there's always kind of uh, end mills uh, specially made for certain materials. Uh, there are end mills you can get that cut and polish acrylic in one pass. There are end mills that cut very particular plastics or composite materials like carbon fiber. And there are end mills for cutting 
big, huge areas or small, intricate areas. Again, there's an end mill for the job if you need it done. They're always hold in something called a collet. Now, collets also take many forms. You can see an ER32 collet, which is a very common type of collet. Um, there are also other forms of collets that are simpler and from more older um, systems like lathes use a, a more archaic form of collet that operates in a very similar way. A collet, unlike a chuck. So in the case of a chuck, like on a drill press or a hand drill, typically, will have three or four jaws that move in unison as you twist a collar. Those jaws close in around a tool bit or some form of material to hold it in place. Now, what's great about a chuck is that it can handle a wide variety of sizes and is really adaptable and quick to install and take things out. However, it only has contact with a drill bit or any sort of material you're using in three spots. That means the grip isn't very strong. A collet, like you can see in this example here of an ER32, is actually a flexible metallic sleeve that has a precisely engineered hole to allow a certain size of shank through it. Then that is placed into a special holder with a collar placed over it. As the collar is tightened, that actual flexible metal collar condenses onto the shaft locking it in place and giving it much more area of contact on that shank, making it a much stronger connection. They're designed to actually hold things at much greater torque. Again, to that point I made before, end mills should not be used with a drill press. That's another reason. A chuck doesn't have that grip strength to properly hold an end mill for long periods of time. Another thing to know about end mills, um, again, all different types of shapes. They can also be coated or uncoated for various reasons. You know, a lot of, just like drill bits, you'll see fancy ones, ooh, titanium nitride, and all these other crazy, cool, colorful coatings that, yeah, zirconium, yeah. zircon X, three, you know, they, all kinds of names. I love just seeing what they come up with sometimes. Um, another thing that's mentioned here, because we talked about straight down and up cuts, one thing I think is interesting here is I talk about compression cuts. Sometimes you want the best of both worlds. You want an up cut and a down cut. And so they make end mills. And I believe actually that illustration there with the two helical arrows uh, just next to the straight edge end mills there is an example of a compression bit. A compression end mill will have a down flute on the top and an up flute on the bottom. So it's pulling out chips from the bottom, but pushing down the rest of the material. Um, they are very crazily engineered. They look insane when you see them, um, but uh, they're also very expensive. Um, they come in different shank diameters. Um, typically what we'll use here at Makehaven uh, is a quarter or a half, but they can go up to three quarters and go down to one. Um, again, end mills for any day of the week. You'd be surprised just seeing how much you can find. They typically will have uh, between one to four flutes, obviously for more demanding work. Like if you look at metal end mills, they can have like eight, nine, 10 different flutes. And that's not even including carbide machining, which is a totally different beast, which we'll leave for a different discussion some other time. Now there are limitations to certain machines. And this is actually a very helpful chart talking about what we have um, accessible at making. So the things you're gonna to wanna to look at are machine rigidity, machine size, and then especially for us today, barrier to entry for understanding these machines. So to look at this, looking at machine rigidity, that is how stiff is the machine and how close of a tolerance can it keep as it's operating and cutting out your parts. By that, you have to realize that while it is very uh, precisely controlled, there's always going to be a little error inherent in every single system. The shaft of the actual motor might not be perfectly aligned, and it might have a little bit of wobble to it. Uh, different motors on the gantries may be dying, or the ball screw could be messed up, or maybe one of the belts is jammed, you know, and that's going to lead to certain inaccuracies as the machine goes through. But also certain machines are designed from the bottom up with only a certain level of rigidity to be included within them. As you can see here, the Shapoko, which is a fairly entry level and kind of low power CNC, is obviously going to be less rigid. As you get up to the Gerber, though, that's a big, giant, like professional grade machine. That's going to be much more rigid than the Tormach, which is actually designed to cut metal, 
Well, that's going to be designed to be as rigid as possible, even though it's a relatively small machine size, as you can see in the following chart. Yes. Can you please define the entry? I know you used it. I assumed it was an entryway, but I don't know what you just said. Yes. So Adam's going to draw a helpful diagram on the board. I'm going to move the camera so we can kind of get a look at that. So the, the bed of, say, the Gerber a CNC machine, the gantry is the bit that goes above the bed and holds the spindle. So this is the spindle with the end mill that does the cutting of the material and it's sitting on this gantry that goes across and lets it move side to side. And then the whole gantry will typically move to go forward and back. So that gives you your two, your X and Y axes. Yeah. And the Z axis will be the spindle moving up and down. I like to think of it as the bridge that the tool travels across right. that also moves up and down the um, the workspace. Um, but good question, Gina. Okay. Oh, I haven't looked at all. Oh, yeah, no, I have got the compression bit picture in the chat. Ah. Loops going opposite directions. Oh, yeah. Is it made in that color or they're just being cute with that? That is fine. <laughs> Amana coats their tools in shiny. Oh, because it looks like a titanium blue. coating or something. Yeah. It's like, oh boy. And they also have the disclaimer on every tool page that the coating will wear off after the first use, but the coating or the, the color will wear off, but the coating will still be there. So, uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Old Amana tool. What are you going to do? Um, but anyway, uh, yes, yeah, so thank you for that, Adam. That's a great description of the gantry. And so you can see here also going to machine size, the Tormach is pretty small. It's a very tiny machine, just looks, it has about like a 12 inch square size, but it can cut metal, which is really helpful. The Shapoko, like we were talking about before, has about a 30 inch square workspace, but the Gerber can handle those four by eight sheets. So you stop by a Home Depot, pick up a couple of those, you can just slap those on the workspace of a uh, Gerber, you'd be good to go. Um, barrier to entry, however, that's where we see the Shapoko actually comes out on top being the lowest barrier to entry. It's much more user-friendly, um, easier to get a handle, handle on. And then as you get to the Tormach and the Gerber, well, those are things where you also have to learn a lot about the materials you're cutting and have a lot more knowledge about the tools you're using for those processes. Um, as, a, as a note, um, what I also like next to this diagram, you can see something that we're talking about dog boning. I mentioned this uh, last time, and here's some actual interesting graphical examples, because what's going on is, um, again, Realize that unlike the laser cutter, there is a spinning piece of metal that has to get into those spaces in order to cut them out so that you can actually put two pieces together. That means the best it can cut if it just passes through a little recess are rounded corners. Well, if you don't have rounded corners as part of your assembly, you're going to need the end mill to cut additional material. So you can see in diagrams two and four, how the corners have actually been cut out slightly by the end mill. That can be done as part of the tool path or can actually be done before um, you do the profile cutting by doing a uh, drill grid of just different holes all around and then connect all those holes with a tool path. That's actually how I used to do it back in the day. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's cheating. There are better ways to do it. Um, but there's also a lot of ways to help cut in those reliefs to make sure your joinery fits properly. Uh, you can also, as you can see in the interesting uh, example underneath, you can incorporate the design of the end mill into your joinery so you do not have to worry about cutting reliefs. So there are a lot of ways you can think about your designs moving forward. So next, 
Carbide 3D to the Shapoko. So the Shapoko uh, basically uses um, Carbide Create and Carbide Motion to actually translate our 2D vector artwork into machinable surfaces. Um, it's a lot like the laser cutter in the sense of how it's going to take that 2D information to create outlines. But what different, what's different about the Shapoko is that it actually can pay attention to where the drill bit goes, cutting out area, lower areas called pockets and actually cutting only halfway down the material or three quarters of the way down the material instead of all the way through. Now, Carbide Create is a design software that's used with it. It is available for free so that you can play around with it at home. Um, just like everything else, um, I believe you can, can you import SVG as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can import SVG and um, you can also uh, use it to help refine your design. So here you are with the basic interface of it um, with setup, creating vectors and also importing artwork. And then, of course, the workspace it should be very familiar to all the stuff we've been using, especially when it comes to laser cutting with Inkscape. Um, now, of course, you have the ability to create many different types of shapes, manipulate, move them around, change them. But then you can see underneath that there are uh, there's tools like the tab tool. Now, tabs are something important. Uh, actually, uh, Adam, you mentioned them last week when you were talking about handles, tabs being extra pieces of material you leave on your part so it stays connected to the stock to make sure it doesn't fly away as soon as it gets cut out. Now that's something you have to pay attention to. Unlike the laser cutter, which has constant downward pressure of the vacuum pulling things out and you're cutting relatively lightweight materials, that keeps it down and stable. In a CNC machine where it actually has to physically contact the work, you need to hold it down. So we saw from Adam's example, he actually had very robust clamping, holding down the pieces of wood so that the end mill can't swish them out of the way or push it or move it around. I've had stuff like that happen. It is unbelievably scary. Uh, tabs are a great way to make sure it never does because it still stays connected to your stock and keeps it in place. So you can also do operations like flipping it over and cutting it out in a different way or just to keep you safe to make sure your thin parts don't disappear in the dust collection or make the bit explode like happened to me one time. <laughs> so yeah. how, sorry, how thick do your tabs need to be? They're usually based on the thickness of the material and the tool you're using to cut. So full thickness? No, they don't have to be full thickness. They'll usually be like a lot of times tab thickness and correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, but typical tabs for certain materials are usually one eighth to a quarter of an inch which can typically be about half of the material um, or depending on what it is, uh, some programs let you actually specify the height of the tab if you want to risk it a little bit, but it's usually about half of the material. I was just searching, I, I forgot my show and tell item that was the, the circle, like the ones I showed the picture of earlier where uh, the material was lifted. So the tabs were only about I had them at an eighth of an inch tall, but because the material was lifted, oh. they ended up only being like a fraction, like a sixteenth or less. So when I did the cutout, and then I did a drilling tool path, and one of the pieces when it went to drill, it pushed it out um, and broke all the tabs, so the piece was loose and it got caught broken half and thankfully did not break the end mill. Yeah. Um, but that was a cool sound. <laughs> it's so Maker. loud and it's so concerning and it freaks you out. Yeah. I was cutting out parts for a vacuum form book years ago and like same thing happened. The bed wasn't perfectly level so the tabs got too thin. It sucked up a tiny piece and then just like Boom! Like the thing exploded and like little metal chunks went up the dust collection. Oh, I was like, oh, great. Thankfully, just a bit exploded. The machine was fine. Good. But, you yeah. know. Uh, but also, just like before, there are node tools for editing the nodes of different vectors. Gina, did you have a follow up question? Or? Uh, so, <laughs> with today's project, you're telling me that you designed the tabs to be at the bottom layer. And then, so and then you cut on top, the circles on top. So the circles get cut all the way through and tabs are just 
there were four spots around the circle where the bit just bumped up a little bit as it went around, so it didn't cut all the way through in those spots. Um, so it just leaves a little bit of material there yeah. to hold hold the piece so it isn't loose. You don't need to have a full thickness of material. What happened in Adam's case was a lot of times if the work surface you're using or the material is warped slightly, the machine doesn't know that there's a slight variation in height. Yeah. And sometimes that can mean if there's a warp in the middle, the bit thinks it's cutting an eighth inch tab, it might be cutting a sixteenth or less. In Adam's case, it looks like it may have cut all the way through or mostly through, and that was enough to loosen the part and snap it out. Um, generally, and again, what's happening is when it's starting to cut the outer tool path that has tabs on it, let's say in the case of a circle, the first several passes, because it doesn't cut everything usually in one pass, there can be one or two passes, depending on the thickness of material and the size of end mill you're using. But it'll do a full pass, and then it goes down, does another pass, and then it goes down for that final pass. And as it's cutting all the way through, it stops, goes up a little bit, goes over, then uh -huh. down again, so leaving that little bit of extra tab. Yeah, so that's that something that sense. that's something that the software calculates for you. It's not something you have to code into it and remember to draw. You just tell it, please add tabs to this, and then it will choose locations. Some softwares even allow you to pick like exactly where the tabs go. Um, it looks like with Shikoko, it's kind of just automated. I think it gives you an option to place tabs manually. And do you have to set the, the tool path? The tool manually, path, like so you, with the water jet. you tell it where you want tabs and it will, the tool path will add them. Um, generating the tool path we're going to get to, but it is more involved even than the water jet. You okay. do have to, you have to tell it how fast you want it to move and how fast the router is going to be spinning. Everybody else ready? Okay, let's go. <laughs> Everybody else here ready? <laughs> So again, let's take a look at the workflow, kind of touch back to what we were talking about. We've talked about computer-aided design, putting those shapes together, computer-aided machining, where we simulate how it's going to be cut, and then that is pushed out into G-code that tells the machines what to do. Very similar to what we saw in 3D printing. In fact, you can look at 3D, pre 3D printing almost as the inverse of this. So instead of creating G-code that slices things out of material, the 3D printer creates G-code to slowly stack up material and build something. I don't know. I thought that was mind-blowing. I guess nobody else seems does. But when we get into tool paths, this is where you can see the tool path interface. And what we have here are different forms of tool paths. So you can see there some of the basic ones that are important to know are, of course, contour meaning create a path around this curved line. Pocket is actually saying to create a lower space in a material. So for instance, um, the way you think about it is if in a board, I wanted to cut a circle not all the way through, but I wanted it to be a full surface that was lower than the top surface of my material, you would cut a pocket. So the CNC would know to go cut a circle and then also cut out the whole middle of the circle at the same height. That's one of the big strengths of the CNC machine is that it can actually cut partially through so you can create things like alignment features or do engravings. You also have uh, just next texture is drill. That's where you can use a drill tool or a properly designed end mill which can handle plunge cutting. And you can actually make it just drill holes in several places. Uh, most programs just have to pick a bunch of holes and tell it, okay, drill right there, drill right there, drill right there. Um, and then there are some other advanced paths like texture, actually adding a type of repetitive texture across the entire surface. Again, another really cool thing that CNCs can do, a uh, different contour machine to actually create undulating surfaces. Um, and then, of course, keyhole operations, which would be specifically, as I mentioned before, keyhole profile cutters, um, which are a special type of T-shaped cutter that can create uh, those kind of drop interlocking um, features you see in a lot of uh, furniture and stuff. If I were to draw a picture of them, you've probably seen them all the time, stuff that hangs on the wall. They look like this, it's called keyhole fixtures. You need a special bit to cut them. It's a bit that has a T part that's as big as this, 
and a shank that's as big as this, and it goes through and cuts out a whole pocket here so you can have a screw go in and hide inside and track something. It's a very cool thing. And when you learn how to make them and you're like 22 years old, you feel like a guy. <laughs> <laughs> but you can also see here uh what's also important to see are the list of tool paths this shows you exactly which tool paths you put together and it also shows you a sequence of tool paths it's important to make sure what's going to get cut when to make sure things stay accurate and safe as part of your cutting just like with laser cutting it makes sense to do all of your internal features first then do your final external cuts there may be certain instances, especially with CNC machining, that it might make sense to do something out of that order. But generally, as a rule, do all your internal features first to maintain rigidity and accuracy. Okay. Any questions about that so far? Any questions online? Looking good. Okay. So now here's what's a cool thing. You can actually see previews of the tool paths that are being traded. This is something that is very helpful because it's showing you not only where it's going to cut, uh, the green lines show where it's actually going to cut what looks to be a pocket pass for the make haven part of it. The red lines actually show where the tool is just going to travel and be above the material. And then if you look just near the M right here in the corner, you can see how the exterior profile is actually several passes. Um, passes really depend, again, the thickness of material and the actual size of the end mill you're using. Generally, what I've been told is, is that if you have the material thickness the same size as your end mill, you want to do two passes, right? So if it's a quarter inch end mill and a quarter inch piece of material, you do two passes. However, if you do a half inch end mill and quarter inch material, the half inch end mill could take the entire quarter of an inch. Again, it kind of is fast and loose and certain machines may not be powerful enough for that type of load, but generally doing multiple passes, not a bad idea. It's less stress on the tool and adds to more longevity and safety of the machine and the tools being used. But the preview is also very important for showing you if there are going to be mistakes and how the machine is interpreting your cut path and also if it's going to cut everything in the proper order. You can see in the group one list there, they're doing the letters first and then the cutout. And they labeled their tool pads so that they can be kept clear to the operator what's going to be done. Adam, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Label your tool pads. <laughs> That's a rousing endorsement. Actually, watch, watch the preview. That is. It's so, there actually is a, there's a gift of a preview. It's, fun too. It's, it's boring and a waste of time until it uh, saves your butt. And it does. So um, also, uh, there is a design elements library, which has a lot of designs. So you don't necessarily have to start from zero. You know, if you're not quite sure how you're going to create different state outlines or other types of vectors, I can see like teddy bears, sports equipment. There's a lot of pre-made stuff that can give you a, a help when you're trying to actually put something together in Carbide 3D. But they're just the vectors. They don't contain all the logic as part of the cut. This is just the artwork you're going to use to then generate a tool path. Keep that in mind. The tool library is also incredibly important because this not only shows you which end mills are sort of preloaded into the machine that it knows how to use, but it also tells you all the different 2D and 3D cutting parameters. 2D parameters are literally how much, it, how far and fast it travels in the 2D direction, that is the X, Y plane. So it's going to go that fast along the line and the cut depth is going to be how much it cuts on every single pass, usually. And then, of course, the RPM it sets. So the RPM actually meaning the speed the motor is moving the end mill. The 3D cutting parameters have to do more with how it will plunge down into a material. And then you'll see things like step over. When it creates a pocket, it has to clear out that material. How much does that end mill have to move over to slowly clear out material and make that space flat? Um, usually, these will be preset. Uh, and these are also editable if new tools are added. 
Um, always be sure, or if you have like a special tool, you're not quite sure how to set up, always work with the facilitator to make sure it's set up properly in the machine, i.e. talk to Adam, and he'll make sure you're good to go. And then post-processing. So um, these are ways that you can actually optimize the G code that is being generated to make it more efficient or to run things in a, a safer way. Um, and I don't know, is there anything else you want to add about that, Adam? Both processors uh, are complicated lists of quirks and features of individual machines and don't worry about them unless you have to. The ones downstairs, there should be, you shouldn't have to worry about post-processing using the Shvoka with carbide. Um, you need to think about it when you're using the Shvoka with other software, but you should uh, be able to find a post-processor easily um, with uh, B-Carve or Fusion 360, um, which would be the most likely ones people in this class would trust. Um, we have them on the computers downstairs that have the carve. There's those processors for the Shvoko. But it's just a post processor is just a list of quirks that this specific machine needs to have the G code dressed up with to be happy. And now Carbide Motion, which allows us to control the Shapoko directly. So when you get into the home screen, it's going to give you everything you need to do to initialize the machine. And also it's going to help you to home the machine, essentially make sure it knows where the origins are in all three directions. And then everything is set and ready to go in order to accept your instructions. Setting an origin is very important because it allows the CNC to know where it is. Um, one thing that's important to note about CNCs is that the way they move is usually through the use of a stepper motor. Now, I'm sure people have heard that term thrown around a little bit. What a stepper motor is, is first you want to think about, we've all seen a regular little electric motor, right? You turn it on, it spins. You turn it off, it doesn't spin. What a stepper motor does is that when a voltage is applied to it, it's actually applied in a pattern that moves two little sets of teeth back and forth, allowing it to step a set number of degrees every single time it makes a circle. So when it's pulsed for a little bit, it knows, oh, I've only moved 10 degrees. A little bit more, oh, I've moved 20 more degrees. So it's a way for the machine to only move a set amount. Now, depending on the sophistication of the machine, it may have sensors on board that allow it to verify how much it's moved and allow it to be adapted. However, on more basic machines like the Shapoko, it's just depending on the fact that it knows where zero is, it knows how far it moved away from zero, and that's how it guesses where it needs to be to cut your artwork. So it's important to realize that as you're going through. So it is possible to, you know, accidentally mess up the machine in various ways, um, especially if it's damaged. That's not good. Sometimes the motors don't work too well or the drive shaft may be messed up, but it's important to realize that. Um, and then uh, it's also important to uh, make sure the tools are Z'd out. Right here, I like how in bold, don't try to outsmart the machine. Um, it has very specific things it's looking for in terms to make sure it knows it's operating safely and accurately. So do make sure you follow those prompts. If it's asking you to change a tool, make sure you do that so that it can actually predict how to cut it. For instance, if you just leave a half inch tool for a path that it's expecting to be using a quarter inch bit for, it's not going to cut that path correctly. The offset's gonna be all off and your part's gonna be either too big or too small. And then, so organizing all the different reference frames. There's the machine home, which uh, is essentially the absolute limits the machine can operate in X, Y, and Z, so that it knows like, here's the maximum limits I can operate. There's the work home, 
which is the specific origin of what you are working on. So if we think about Adam's example, it would be the origin somewhere on his boards that he set to essentially be, this is where I want you to start running the program. And then of course, the tool offset. Like I just mentioned before, it's expecting a tool of a certain size and also a certain depth. And it needs to know those values, the diameter and the length of the tool to make sure it knows precisely where to go. That's also where the work home is important because that origin is not only in X, Y direction, but also Z. So it knows, okay, if I'm here, I'm right on top of the material, I'm gonna go down half an inch to cut what I've been asked to cut. Again, there's no camera or anything watching it. So it has to be reliant on the accuracy of your setups and everything maintaining its rigidity. Make sure the work is clamped down. Again, remember Adam's excellent example of how he clamped down all those boards. Um, it's always important to have definitely downward, but also sideways clamping. Because one thing you have to realize, yes, like any other type of material you're working with, downward pressure is important for keeping the work set down on the material, especially if you have an upcut bit, that upcut's gonna wanna pull the work off of the work surface. So always make sure the clamps are not only holding it down, but also make sure there is adequate side to side clamping. That is very important on CNC machines because remember, they're cutting in sideways directions. That's what they're optimized to do. So there's going to be a lot of pushing on the side and pulling on the side that can slowly work your workpiece out of its clamps. So always make sure that it's at least tied down in all major directions. You wanna think of it as degrees of freedom. You wanna make sure it can't move the X, Y, Z, or rotate. I have had stuff slip while with a CNC, and it is, again, one of the scariest things that can happen because it's a very strong machine with a very fast moving piece of metal that can really do some damage. And it's especially scary when it's a four by eight sheet coming at you. <laughs> So yes, that was some impressive, impressive feeding. Yeah, it, like it got like I think it was also when it happened to me, it was like the bit got stuck and jammed, and then it just started like pulling. It was like a pretty heavy duty CNC, so it was like yeah, pulling yeah. the four by eight sheet. Oh crap! And, like hit the emergency stuff. But thankfully, I, I've, I've gotten through the two big mistakes I've done on CNC. So I did both today. <laughs> they weren't that <laughs> I I uh, we're, we're doing production line CNC stuff to get pretty I'll I'll be doing a case study from those old days today. Uh, um jog menu, this isn't about exercise. This is about moving the actual head of the machine around. So um you can see here, uh, you have speeds of increment, make it go faster or slower, meaning every single time you hit plus or minus X, Y, or Z, it'll move faster. Um, if we remember when we we're setting the focal length on the laser cutter, you can make it go faster or slower based on what the, in that case, the decimal point is set to. But in this case, you can actually much more uh, precisely control the exact speed it's moving. This is helpful if you're trying to, again, set up those origin points on your work and make sure you can easily jog around a giant piece of material without having to wait two hours for the bit to make it all um, manually homing the CNC. So this is important uh, for making sure the machine not only knows the origin of itself, that is the extents of the machine, but also the origin of your work and making sure that right here, the stock size, you're telling it how big the stock is. We want to be as accurate as possible with that. Even kind of, you know, maybe subtracting a little bit from that stock size, just to make sure the bit doesn't go wildly off in some random direction. Um, and that also you have enough space to clamp something down onto. Again, the stock thickness, um, you can set the zero height to the top or bottom. This is very important when you're setting up your tools because you want to make sure that you're setting up your tool path with uh, the Z zero at the top or bottom, depending on how you set it up, so that the machine knows how to interpret the data it's being sent. And then of course the tool path zero in the X, Y direction making sure that that is set up uh, concurrent with what the Shapoko is also saying it's going to interpret as the zero point. You can end up in situations where you've accidentally set the origin to the exact opposite point 
and it starts just cutting air. You know, and that's how you know you may have accidentally shifted the origin a little bit. A minor mistake I once made. <laughs> Make sure to Z all once you have your proper uh, zero location set up. There are a lot of ways to set up these uh, home positions accurately. Um, Adam, I'm sure you have a lot of ways you like to do it. Uh, for Z height, the paper technique is a good one to use. Um, I know for myself, when I like to do the X, Y, zero, I actually like to make sure that a chamfer tool or some very sharply pointed tool is in the CNC, and I use that point to line it up with the exact point on my work. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of ways to do it. Adam, I don't know what's the best way on the Shapoko you found over the years. Using probe slide. Oh, we're gonna talk about probing. Yeah. There we go. It's got a very handy device. Yeah, I forgot the Shapoko had the auto zero. But yes, this is actually, uh, when I saw this, I was like, all those years I did all the stuff I was just telling you guys, I was like, man, I wish I had one of these. Because I think I saw you set it up one time. And um, this is great because it's a little block of aluminum. Um, it's also used for setting the tool height. But what it does is you essentially, you can see here, it's this block of aluminum and you essentially put it on the corner of your work. And when you line up the bit to that exact hole, that's the origin point right in that corner. And then you can also, uh, it automatically probes the top to know exactly where the Z height is the top of your material because it knows as soon as it touches that point, it's that high off of the work. And so it can automatically subtract that height to get the exact top of the material, which is so, so cool. And it makes me mad. I had to guess so many years how deep my material was. Um, and again, so when we import files, Carbide Create and other places, um, as Adam mentioned, Fusion 360 has a pretty robust CAM uh, at part of it as well. So does SolidWorks. Many uh, pretty robust CAD softwares have the ability to plan computer-aided machining pads. Um, and so you can import those directly or like we just learned from Carbide Create, and you can see that in Carbide Motion, we're getting that simulation there. Remember, always check those simulations to make sure they make sense. And then once the information for the tool pads and all the G code has been brought into the Shapoko, you can just go ahead and run it. And that's always the most nerve wracking part, right? You've done all this work, you've set up the machine, gotten all the zeros, modeled it, gotten all the G code, put everything together, and it's going to come down to the start button going and everything cutting perfectly. Uh, once you do it once, it's an incredibly euphoric experience when a job cuts the way you've planned it. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing to note is that there are also specific things that these machines can do, particularly cutting circuit boards. Um, I don't know if anybody uh, right now or anybody listening to this in the future is really interested in prototyping uh, their own PCBs, but there are specific programs that are actually optimized to handle those tasks like flat cam and also carbide copper. So they're gonna be more specific and make it a lot uh, easier to kind of keep track of all your different paths and everything you're trying to set up in those carving tools. So, you know, again, keep in mind for that if you wanna learn more about prototyping your own PCBs, which is a very fun thing you can do. And then back to G code and post processing. So remember, G code stands for geometry code. Fun. I know, you know, I, I really believe that is mine. No, I was going to pull out my fun fact, I thought, which was that G code stands for Gerber code because Gerber was the company that first was standardizing the CNC. Oh, gee, look this up. I'm pretty sure it's just geometry code because I thought I looked it up before, but prove me wrong. I'm really excited. Geometric code. Geometric okay. code. That does make more sense. <laughs> I kind of like the Gerber code because, uh, you know, we have a Gerber downstairs. And you're like, we have the best one. ever. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the original CNC. Um, but so it's always remember, remember the G code is controlling these machines. It's the geometric data that tells the tool go from here to here, follow this path. 
It's all math when you get all the way down. And so um, you have to make sure that you're using software to help you manipulate the G code, like Carbide Create, VCarve, or any other tool of your choice. Um, but also be aware that uh, you may want to, in certain instances, be familiar with how the G code runs and sort of how it goes through thinking about what to do. Um, it'll be helpful going forward, especially if you really want to get very sophisticated with your CNC machining. So again, specific machines, again, from different companies and even down to specific quirks that you know of when you're very familiar with the CNC machine you use, there's going to need to be certain tweaks that are made from the G code into the machine's interpretation of it. And that's where the post-processing is really important, taking care of weird little errors that can show up, um, optimize to work with the motors that are part of that machine, and in certain cases, just optimizing pathfinding for these tools as well. There may be certain ways and certain proprietary ways these machines actually speed up the way they go from tool path to tool path. Um, a lot of they, these machines will come usually with their own control software, much like the Shapoko as well. But you can see there's other companies that have their own specific proprietary ways to handle G code. One thing to point out is also dimensioning. That's what that last paragraph talks about there. It's important to know if the machine's expecting inches, millimeters, or centimeters. Um, that's critical because as we know, an inch is way different from a millimeter and 10 of them is gonna be very different. So it's always good to make sure you know what the machine is going to expect. A lot of these tools will also let you adjust that feature. Um, if, it, if, for instance, it's in a millimeters environment, but you built it in an inch, um, you can either swap the dimensions or have it do a translation. Really depends on the software you're using. VCarve is another very powerful tool that can also do uh, CAM for the tools downstairs. This is actually what I used back in the day. Um, and it is a really good program for uh, not only designing, because it does have the same vector tools that we've seen, Inkscape and other um, tools as well, but it can also uh, do everything that we've seen with the other tools we've been working with, like Carbide Motion, um, Carbide Create, excuse me. So we have a Makerspace edition that is accessible for members. And obviously, Adam, you said a few of the computers downstairs have it installed as well. So feel free to play around with that and figure out its own eccentricities, just like any piece of software. Become familiar with it. Um, I do, uh, one thing that's really interesting is that it's also important to remember where it's setting Z0 positions. Um, and you can see very similar to what we were, were noticing before, how big is the job? What's its thickness? Where are the zeros? Where's the origin or what it calls the XY datum? You know, again, they're all very similar. They might just call things slightly different names or use a different symbol or a different button, but at the end of the day, they all pretty much do the same thing. Um, important things to note, you can see that there are different uh, creation tools, obviously line tools, text tools, modifying tools. And then of course, one thing that is important about VCarve, and that's over here where it says closing of gaps. VCarve doesn't like open lines. It likes everything to be like a contiguous line or shape so that it can interpret, okay, do I cut outside or do I cut inside? Do I cut out a pocket? And so it likes to make sure that everything is closed completely. Um, so a lot of times you can fix that before going into VCarve. When I used VCarve way back when, I actually would uh, translate artwork from Illustrator. And so I would just make sure all the paths were contiguous in Illustrator. And then when I brought it into VCarve, I had fewer problems of you know, extra artifacts showing up. Um, and when I say contiguous, it essentially means one connected complete path. And that is not interrupted or cutting. I just wanna make sure I'm not throwing stuff out there. Uh, and then of course, it has its own set of symbols for actually doing different forms of cutting. So you can see we've got a grid there for drilling, a pocket operation, outline operation, um, doing actual carvings, like carving in letters, and doing roughing and finishing passes. 
So roughing and finishing is not necessarily something we've covered here completely, but generally with CNC tools, you want them to last a long time. So those end mills, if you cut all the material away, all from the start, that tool is going to wear out very quickly. So what you can do is you can take a big, tough, mean tool and use it to cut away a lot of extra material, then use your delicate, finer control tools to refine the surface into a perfect shape where it only has to cut away a little bit. That is a very common practice, especially because those big, meaty tools can do a lot of work, but the tools for fine carving and expert detail are usually very thin and small and very specialized, so they need to be treated with care. And that's where roughing versus finishing comes into uh, play. Roughing can usually happen very fast, very quickly, remove a lot of material. Finishing will take a lot more time and a lot more energy and a lot more patience too, if you're really trying to finish that job before you go home. So setting up a tool path um, is just like before, setting up, uh, selecting the actual line work you're gonna be using, selecting the tool and selecting the material. Um, usually there will be presets with these uh, particular tools in terms of like what in general should be the feed and speed that they use and the different cutting parameters. These will not necessarily reflect the tools you have on hand. So make sure that if you have an odd size tool or a weird size tool or a tool that's not reflected here, that you're actually adding a new tool that will actually reflect what you're trying to cut. Uh, V-Carve, I do believe supports drag knives, for instance. Drag knives are like the big brother of the vinyl cutter. It's for like cutting like big thick canvas. If you want to cut like a giant sail or something on a CNC, you would use what's called a drag knife, which is just like a big honking utility knife on a CNC spindle. And it can just go through and cut the material. It looks like on this particular screen example, it's not set up for drag knives, but it is a type of tool that can recognize. Um, and I don't think let's worry about calculating speeds and feeds with that YouTube video. We can do that later. And again, VCARB has this fun thing of previewing tool paths and they're animated. So you can see how it went from a roughing pass to a finishing pass. And it also shows you the logic that the tool and the machine itself is going to use to finish it. So notice how in this roughing pass it kind of operates how you think. But then for the finishing pass, it doesn't do the middle, but instead does the outside first and then does the inside. I've asked about this for people who've used it a lot. It's just kind of that weird black magic. They're like, yeah, whatever the algorithm does, apparently that was faster than doing it from the middle out. Um, but you know, generally that's just kind of the ghost in the machine here of like what it decides to do when it cuts the material. But these previews are great uh, because it lets you do a sanity check and make sure that what you're telling the machine to do, at least in this idealized virtual space, is what you expect it's going to do. Uh, and then finally, um, you can see here with, um, for instance, this is the carving feature. Now notice here how it's not interpreting the text itself as bubble letters, if you will, hollow letters, but in fact, it's refined it to a center line that a V bit is going to drag into and create this beveled effect. Um, and that's kind of the difference between like engraving and carving versus the cutting that it will do. So just realize that certain specialized tool paths are also going to presume a certain type of tool as part of the process. Next steps for here, try something out. Uh, very simple jobs here. We've got signs, we've got cool patterns, textures, nameplates. That thing in the middle kind of looks like a replica of like a Nazca line thing or something, but I thought it was a maze at first. <laughs> I don't think it is. Like marble. Yeah, like that. Maybe a marble track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also, uh, don't forget uh, Open Desk, which is a desk you can make using a CNC. Although that's more like a Gerber project, the Shapoko, a little bit too small to handle something like that. Make it really small. I've done that before. I've used like laptops in it. Yeah, it's fun to kind of create little scale versions of furniture. Um, but also like think about having fun with patterns, kind of push your limits of what you think the CNC can do. And really what's what's nice about it because it's different from laser cutter, you can think about texture. You can think about how something will feel, you know? Yeah, maybe your Snoopy box 
maybe it can have some CNC wood grain in there to make it appear more like driftwood you found on the side of the road. You know, I'm just saying, Gina, if we don't see that next week, it's going to be a big problem. Next week is the 3D printer. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, there's still that. So first things first, we're going to be bothering Adam and other facilitators to get badged on the Shapoko. That's that first step in your CNC journey. Um, the Gerber is the big boy one, so you really have to be confident on the Shapoko. Adam, I don't know if you can kind of talk about what's the growth from Shapoko to Gerber. Um, doing a couple projects and being comfortable with the Shapoko. Because um, the Gerber for the Shapoko, we kind of say you can start with the defaults that it has for tools, for feats, uh, and go from there. Um, it's a little, it holds your hand a little bit more. The Gerber is uh, a little bit more Wild West. So, and actually, I will also say right now has a backlash issue that means it cannot cut circles that can only cut ellipses and slanted lines will always be slightly out of dimension so until someone takes upon themselves to fix that uh more than i have or the people before me who have beaten their heads against it um the uh the shapoko is actually the preferable machine to mm -hmm. use for things that can fit on the bed. Um, so if you have a big table you want to make uh, that you want to cut out of a whole sheet of plywood, you can definitely use the Gerber. Um, and we'll go through after after you've done some projects on the Shiboko, feel comfortable um, running a job there. Who keeps track of a couple of projects and if you feel it's, comfortable? It's you. Okay, but you can kind of say, like, I'm confident. Um, um, yeah, yeah, and if you need kind of about what, what project you need to do, what your needs are. Uh, so I guess I'm just saying don't feel like the Shapoko is limited because it can do quite a lot of projects that you can try. It's just the dimensional limitations are kind of the biggest, the biggest thing. Um, but the Gerber is also definitely attainable. Mm -hmm. that is just... And one thing I'd like to mention about CNC projects, don't, don't forget about work hold. Now we talked about clamping, but when you're laying out your board, and you've got that piece of stock, remember, you have to save maybe a quarter an inch to a half an inch on that edge, and then add a little bit more because the tool might have to pass through there. Make sure your clamps are not going to get hit by that uh, cutter head. So it's important you plan ahead. Make sure there's a good border around there for you to clamp to. If you're adding tabs, make sure they're there. There's a lot of different work holding solutions, but uh, for the Shapoko, it's clamps. The Gerber doesn't have a vacuum table, does it? It does have vacuum, but the spoil board is so chewed up. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't work very well. Uh, spoil so board there's, is what's underneath. So yeah. the spoil board is the piece of MDF that sits on the whole bed, so that when somebody sets up their Z height a little bit wrong and goes down below the surface of the table, um, you're just cutting into this spoilable cheap material um, that's easy to re-flatten, uh, which it is overdue for. So soon, soon it will be cleaner than it is currently. But the uh, the vacuum holding, we actually have a, a literal just vacuum that runs those tubes running underneath the table of the Gerber and it just you turn it on and it sucks air down through the spoil board which can be super strong um, like on a well set up machine that can be the only work holding you need it can actually hold if you have a full 
full sheet or even smaller sections of a sheet um, as long as it has good contact with the surface, i.e. the spoil board is not all screwed up, um, the vacuum can hold enough, uh, put enough down force on the material that it will keep it stationary. So does the spoil board have holes all the way through so that the vacuum can It actually I, ideally does not have holes. MDF is porous enough that the vacuum exactly. just pulls right through the right through the material. It's pretty <laughs> wild when you use it for the first time, but it actually does like hold stuff quite well. Other techniques, especially if the vacuum table isn't working, double-sided tape um, is a good option. You can screw the material down, not the best because it also ruins the spoil board underneath. That, that, that is, it's, uh, use your own spoil board, bring your own spoil board. If you're gonna do that, yeah. So it. it's important to not put screws in there because it messes up the spoil board. Um, in a shared shop, that is <laughs> it's, it's kind of what you have to do. It needs to be a last resort. Or yes. Avoided. Mm -hmm. Double-sided tape is your best bet. There are some cool things like plastic nails that I've seen in the past, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. You can get a nail gun that like shoots plastic nails, so you can just nail all over the place, and the CNC just cuts right through them, and something happens. You get a fun and does it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the logging industry. Um, but anyway, yeah, so get badged on that stuff, slowly learn about the bigger brother. And that's all the major stuff here. Um, I did want to share um, a little bit of work I did in the past to kind of learn a little bit about stuff I used to do. Um, so this is a quick little intro on a project that I did. And let's see, is it going to give me full screen? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Hold on a sec. Stop this. I'm going to share again in one moment. Oh, there it goes. So maybe I'll just share the uh, window itself. Just one sec. There we go. Thank you, Mr. TV. We're going to go ahead and share this one more time. So this is a project I did back in the day. This would have been like circa 2014, 2015. Um, these shapes here are meant to be balloons for a Hello Kitty trade show booth. I had to make the Hello Kitty bow, a star, a sphere, and a heart. And basically they had to be made out of MDF uh, to give you a better idea of their dimensionality. They had These are what the finished parts had to look like. So they're pretty thick to give you an idea. The heart was about like two feet wide by like a foot deep or a foot wide. And then about deep, it had to be like about eight inches deep. Oh, wow. And these were gonna be vacuum forms. So I was designing the buck that would create these shapes. So in vacuum forming, uh, for those of you who don't know, vacuum forming is when you take a heated sheet of plastic that has almost started to melt you put it over a form, oftentimes called a buck, and then a vacuum is pulled on that system, sucking the plastic down over the buck, and it takes the plastic then takes the shape of the buck put underneath of it. Um, there's a lot of design considerations to make for that, things like draft, certain radii, and then also, of course, the limit of what your vacuum table can handle. So these were designed to go on a 48 by 48 inch table, and that's kind of the size you need to make sure you weren't going to get webbing, which is when too much plastic is there. And it creates like weird little ribs and stuff on your parts. Um, and not only would these have to be this size when done, but on vacuum formed parts, you have to put them on a riser. So I also had to plan for them to be just a tiny bit taller so that we'd have somewhere to cut them out of the plastic sheet after they were formed. So what I ended up making um, question. Question. What's that? Um, is the back of the shape flat? Yes. It's perfectly flat because when it's vacuum formed, the plastic goes over it and when it's cut out, it's a hollow shape of what that was. So then did you um, create two shapes and stick them together? 
For this particular application, they were going to be hung on a wall. So, so I had to create a template for a backer piece that was cut out of essentially foam core that would get glued to the inside and then they'd get glued to the wall. Additionally, they had to look like balloons. So each one of these you'll see in what I sent what I set up for the CNC cutting operation was each of these has an affordance for a little tab that gets inserted on the bottom. So I'm just going to jump over to that. These are the planning documents for how to build it. So what you're seeing here is they were going to be too tall for the actual throat of the CNC machine. So I actually had to make them in slices. And then I also had to create each specific layer slice. So you can see here, I'm actually creating uh, different spots for everything to pass through. I'm having, uh, uh, you can see the first layer of cuts I'm doing is a drill operation to create a chamfered hole, uh, a countersunk hole that would help me align different features. And so if I zoom in a little, I'll talk a little bit about the logic of how I designed this. So you can see here's the couple of shapes. That's the very, very top of the circle. And you can see each part has a few main features. The external piece, along with different layers for each cut, that it was stepped so that we could assemble it and smooth it into the proper shape. But also, you can see I have very small alignment holes so that I could stick wooden rods through everything and make sure the form was properly aligned. This is that tab affordance I was talking about, so that I was making a separate piece that was a little balloon tab that would get stuck into the bottom. And then the large circles are first to reduce the weight of the buck, because as you can imagine, if it's a solid big chunk of MDF, that thing is heavy. And when you're moving it in and out of the mold every day, you don't want to do that. That also serves double duty of giving me air channels to drill into the part so that if the vacuum isn't pulling tight enough around that MDF form, I can add little pinholes and those would create these larger holes that allow me to build channels into it so the plastic can get sucked down around more of the material. And so you can see it's pretty straightforward in terms of how many layers I was creating. You can see here are parts for that little tab. Um, and then this is just the spec sheet um, to make sure I was keeping track of every single cut I was going to be making. So from uh, creating the chamfered holes, and I think I also chamfered a few edges to make sure uh, the, rod, the actual uh, alignment rods I was using would fit, but then also creating the alignment holes, and then also creating the internal cuts for all the holes, and then going in and doing each layer cut then cutting each one of those shapes completely out. Um, a very complicated set of operations to actually do. Um, so you can see here, that's the how many operations there were, it went on the two pages. And then I had to do one special just for the bow itself. You can also see, this is the last portion here that I wanna mention. As I said, there, these were risers. So these were the risers I had to add to the bottom so there was enough meat of extra plastic to cut off once they had been pulled. Um, I was scoping around my old stuff. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of them, but they came out quite good. And the reason why we vacuum formed them is because if you use clear plastic, you paint the inside, you create a scratch resistant colored piece of very shiny candy colored plastic that can be thrown in a crate, <laughs> slapped onto a wall, and then unfortunately thrown in the garbage when done, which is why I don't work in that industry anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's kind of like a little project I had to do a lot of very complicated CNC operating on. Um, and of course the layering of it, gluing it together, smoothing it down, coating it in resin, sanding it again, getting it to like a perfectly smooth surface, to where it actually did, the bucks did in fact resemble this uh, once everything was said and done. But it's kind of one of those things um, in the CNC world, uh, especially with vacuum forming, it is a very useful practice uh, to use a CNC for making these forms. Uh, later on, they would upgrade the CNC so it could actually cut 
larger three-dimensional shapes and I didn't have to do it as complexly as I did here, I was able to just make a block of MDF and then cut the shape out of it afterwards, which saved a lot of time for everybody overall. But that's just kind of a little case study of working with a CNC in the real world and a little bit on vacuum forming, which we have a small one downstairs. Um, so if anybody has questions about vacuum forming, I can share a little bit of information about that. <laughs> I don't know if this is something we cover in foundations completely, but it is an option. Uh, but anyway, that completes tonight. Um, are there any questions for those of us still online? And I think it might just be, yep, Javier's still there. But uh, I think that'll cover everything for this evening. So for those of you watching in the future, have a good night, and we'll see you next week for the next topic.